you open your Bibles to Acts chapter 13, we're going to look at the church at Antioch. From time to time, it's good to take a look at other churches, especially those in the New Testament, of course. And this is an interesting congregation, the one that really is eye-catching and interesting to look at and to analyze. You know, if you stop and think about it, if we as modern-day churches just compare ourselves to other modern-day churches, we might not be doing what is wise. I remember what the Apostle Paul said about all the false teachers that were patting each other on the back and breaking their arms as they commended each other, and yet they were all wrong. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. That they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. So from time to time, a wise congregation, a wise Christian will compare themselves to the church of the New Testament, one that God commended. Or if we are a Christian, we look at the example that Paul set for his others as well. So let's look at Acts chapter 13. We're going to back up also to chapter 11, but we'll start with this. And, and I want you to notice that, of course, we're talking about Antioch, Syria, which is on the far right side of the map up there, about 300 miles north of Jerusalem. Again, for us, that'd be a few hours' drive, but back then, that's quite a trip. But this church here in Antioch of Syria, just north of Jerusalem, which is down this area, was a stepping stone as the, for the Lord's church as it progressed throughout all of Asia Minor. And you see how that would work. Another very instrumental church is the one here at Ephesus. They're important because of the location and because of the good work Paul did there and the strong eldership and the strong church that, they, that came from that. And they once again became a tremendous stepping stone because from Ephesus, all Asia heard the gospel. There was such a crossroads for all these traveling people that the gospel was spread from this region. So those are all important congregations that some we can learn a lot from. Here's an example of what it looks like today, Antioch, Syria. Underneath all those modern cities and modern houses are the ruins of the ancient city of Antioch. Today it's called Antakya, Turkey. And so you can go over there and maybe see some of the ruins. And of course, the Bible says that it was set on the Orontes River. And there's a picture of that today. And you can see how the city is built all around that river. But it's really the city that we're, I mean, the congregation that we're interested in. And I say Antioch as a congregation was unique. In Acts 11 and verse 26, it says, When he had found him, talking about Barnabas finding Saul. He brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. I often wondered back when I was younger why they didn't call Christians first at Jerusalem. Or why they didn't call them Christians first in some church in Judea. Or even in the northern part. But they called them first at Antioch. I think there's a reason for it. This is actually the first congregation that combined both Jews and Gentiles into one body. And that was no small feat. Because the Jews are learning to accept the Gentiles. The Gentiles are learning to become godly people instead of ungodly people. And the mix was very difficult and somewhat strange. <laughs> But just the same in Galatians 3, 28 and 9, the Apostle Paul said, When we obey the gospel, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all what? One. one in Christ Jesus. And that's what we see at Antioch. A church that became one in spite of all their diversity. So he said, if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What is unique about Antioch is the wide variety of people from different backgrounds, and yet they all melded together in one congregation, and they were a tremendous force for good, as we'll see in our lesson tonight. 
Here are some of the characters we read about. Of course, Barnabas, we know, came up from Jerusalem, so he's a Jew. Saul, who was born in Cilicia, but was a Jewish person who studied to be a high council Jew, later became an apostle, gave up all of his personal aspirations to become an apostle of Jesus Christ, and yet he also was a Roman citizen. Then you have Simeon called Niger. And so as the name indicates, here is a black man who fits well into this congregation. Lucius of Cyrene and Nicholas a proselyte. The names alone tell you that they have all kinds of different backgrounds, all kinds of different languages, all kinds of different nationalities, and yet they're mentioned as being one in Christ Jesus. So the cultural diversity was destroyed by the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I don't mean destroyed in that it was lost, but that was not supreme in the minds of these people. And so they were called Christian first to Antioch. Well, Bauer, Danker, and Gingrich in their Greek studies said the word Christian means one who is associated with Christ. A Christ partisan or a Christian. Again, Laonidas said it's one who is identified as a believer and follower of Christ. And we remember this morning in our lesson that King Agrippa said to Paul, almost you persuade me to be a Christian. And Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 15 and 16, let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other men's matters. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, rather let him glorify God on his behalf. So Christian was a special name given to a special group of Christians Disciples, believers, followers, adherents to Jesus Christ. But who were they called Christians by? They were called Christians first in Antioch. Well, some have suggested that that was a name of derision given by the enemies. And I beg to differ. The word called comes from the Greek word krematizo. And that word is found nine times in the New Testament. And every single time it is used of something God does. Let me show you. In Matthew 2 and verse 12, Joseph and Mary were divinely warned about Herod seeking the young child's life. In Matthew 2 and verse 22, again, they were warned by God. In Luke 2 and verse 26, something was revealed by the Holy Spirit. The same word is revealed. In Acts 10 and verse 22, um, Cornelius was divinely instructed to call for Simon Peter. In Romans 7 and verse 3, Paul is describing how the Jews should be dead to the law of Moses, saying that if a woman is married to a second husband while her first husband lives, she shall be what? Called an adulteress. Well, called by who? By God. In Hebrews 8 and verse 5, Moses was divinely instructed on how to build the tabernacle. In Hebrews 11 and verse 7, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his household. And again, Hebrews 12, 25, Do not neglect him who spoke on earth, but him is Jesus Christ. So every single time that word is used, it has the idea of being called or directed or warned or instructed by God. That being so, when we read in Acts 11 and verse 26, that they were called Christians first at Antioch, we know why. This is what God intended. Didn't he say, go preach the gospel to every creature? And yet the Jews, when they in Jerusalem obeyed the gospel, their original thought was that, well, we are going to convert Gentiles, but we're going to make proselyte Jews out of them because Christianity is a Jewish religion. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. That was not the case. Another beautiful thing about Antioch is, in spite of their diversity, they were united. They were one in Christ Jesus. Again, let's look at some of these individuals. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 27, we read about Barnabas. It says, But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And so Barnabas was a friend of the Apostle Paul before he became an apostle. And yet he's one that's included in this congregation now up here in Antioch. 
Simeon is mentioned again in chapter 13 and verse 1. Lucius of Cyrene might be the same Lucius that Paul refers to in Romans 16 and verse 21. Manian, who was a companion to Herod the Tetrarch. And he's mentioned in Acts 13 and 1. So there you have a political background which is contrary to the Jewish people. And yet that fellow became a Christian. They're all united by the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that gives significance to the statement of Paul in Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's what? The power of God to salvation. For therein the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as is written, just to live by faith. Amen. But he included both Jew and Gentile in that congregation. So what could possibly bring these diverse people together? And the answer is the power of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's how it should be throughout the whole world. No one should be excluded from any congregation based on their race or their background or their culture. If they're willing to submit to the gospel of Jesus Christ, then they're welcome. They should be included. And so at Antioch, that's what happened. And God made that a point. Furthermore, the church of Antioch was evangelistic. Let's look at chapter 13 a little more closely. They were evangelistic by divine instruction. It says in verse 2, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted. Who ministered to the Lord and fasted? Well, Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Manian. And Saul, all these teachers, can you imagine having all these great teachers in one congregation? As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. And they go off on what we call the first missionary journey. But Antioch blessed them and sent them on their way, and they're interested in their well-being. A good, strong congregation will always be interested in Christians in other places, churches in other places, or establishing churches in other places. Sometimes I feel that today in our modern world, with all the ability we have to travel near and far, we seem to take an indifferent attitude toward churches in other places. But not this congregation. They were diverse. They all came from different backgrounds. They were all traveling people. And so they were concerned about churches elsewhere. They were also benevolent because if you back up to Acts chapter 11, after Paul had gone there to work with them, it says in Acts chapter 11 and verse 27, Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul, verse 25. And in verse 27, In those days... Prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So they were benevolent when the need arose. They didn't just give to be giving. There was a real need. And notice the pattern we have here. This was a mixed congregation of Jews and Gentiles, but they were sending to an area that really was comprised strictly of Jewish Christians. And Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 15 when he says really what he was doing, he went out of his way to make sure that these needy saints in Jerusalem and Judea were taken care of but more than anything, he was trying to get the Jewish Christians in Judea and Jerusalem to be accepting of Gentile Christians, not as Jewish proselytes, but as simply Gentile Christians. And what better way to do that than to show them your love for them by giving their time of need. They gave freely and proportionately. They gave willingly and as they were able. It was delivered to the churches in Judea by chosen men. They chose Barnabas and Saul to be their deliverers. And it was received by trusted men, the elders in those congregations. And so that being the case, you see how that should be. And then they were doctrinally sound as well. And that doesn't come easy. Again, if you notice, we'll skip over in chapter 13. They sent Barnabas and Saul on their missionary journey. And Luke records a good bit of that. 
in 13 and 14, but in chapter 15 we have a problem. What happens when the church runs into doctrinal issues? Let's see. In verse 1, Judean men came up from Jerusalem and said, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Well, that's interesting because Barnabas came from Jerusalem. And he went up there and he saw the converted Gentiles. And he was thrilled about that. Went and found Saul of Tarsus, who likewise was thrilled to see Gentiles become Christians. But now word of these Gentile converts comes down all back to Jerusalem and apparently these Judean men didn't think everything was being taught so they came up and said, well now you've got to be circumcised if you really want to be saved. So they changed the gospel here, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, be circumcised. Well, of course, it says Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them. Now look those words, words up in the Greek and you know what they mean? No small dissension and dispute. <laughs> you can't improve on that. They had a big argument. I don't know if they hated one another or got in each other's face, but I do know that Paul was going to defend his position. His position was, you do not need to be circumcised to be saved, even if men from Judea, from what some might look as the original congregation back in Jerusalem, even if they say so, that's not true. Well, there's a big argument going on, big difference. I'm sure some of the Gentile Christians at this point are beginning to worry about their salvation, wondering how they're going to be treated by the Jewish brethren. But the church at Antioch then sent Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem to the elders and to the apostles who were still in that city to discuss this matter. And I want you to notice how the truth was established. Sometimes we miss this point. Our denominational friends read Acts 15 and say, well, there is a church council, so now we're going to have worldwide organizations, and we're going to come together once a year, and we're going to vote on what we believe, and when the votes pass, that's what we do. And you say, where do you get your authority for that? They say, well, the Jerusalem Council, Acts 15. Well, is that what happened? Did they all come down to Jerusalem and vote on the subject? Let's look carefully and see. First of all, the truth was established by a direct command. In verse 7, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the hearts, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. Us who? Us Jewish Christians. So he's saying, here's God approving of Gentiles as Gentiles in the house of Cornelius when the Holy Spirit fell upon that household. You can go back and read that in Acts 10 yourself. So he said that he made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. And here the word faith is to be contrasted with the law. The faith of the gospel, the system of the gospel, not by the works of the law. Circumcision falls under the works of the law. And so Peter is saying, God has already shown me by the vision which I saw of clean and unclean animals coming down. And God said to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. He said, not so, Lord, for I never touched anything that's common or unclean. And God said, what I have cleansed, do not you call common or unclean. And while he was thinking on that after it happened three times, God wanted to make sure he didn't miss the point. <laughs> There's a knock on the door. Someone answers the door and says, what's up? So, well, we have a Gentile named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian regiment, and an angel appeared to him and said, call for Simon Peter in this household and ask him to come preach the gospel. Well, Simon Peter figured out, I better go preach the gospel. And he took some Jewish brethren with him just to, verify what he was doing so he wouldn't get in trouble and they went to the household of Cornelius and the first thing Cornelius I mean they said to Cornelius was you know how it is unlawful for a Jew to come and have association with the Gentile but God has shown me that what God has cleansed I'm not to call common or unclean and therefore I perceive that you're to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ he preached the message they believed the Holy Spirit came upon these Gentiles, and that was God's way of saying, I approve of these people as they are, 
And based upon that, they're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now Peter's recounting that in chapter 15. So he's saying, okay, we've got this big dispute even from our own brethren here in this congregation that I'm an elder in. And number one, God never said anything about circumcising the house of Cornelius or any of the Gentiles. God makes no distinction between Jew or Gentile. Therefore, he purifies them by the faith of the gospel, not by the works of the law. Well, then number two, <clears throat> by the way, he says, Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? You know, the Jews needed a wake-up call. The law of Moses was done away with because the blood of bulls and goats cannot do what? Take away sin. And yet the law was given to show people how to live sinlessly so they could be justified before God. But everyone who ever sinned, which is every human being who lived under the law of Moses, was guilty by the law, and the law didn't have a solution for the problem. So he said, why would we want to put this system on them when it destroyed us? We couldn't be saved by it as Jews. They certainly can't be saved by it as Gentiles. Therefore, let's think about this. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we should be saved in the same manner as they. That's Peter's way of saying there's neither Jew nor Greek. Bond or free, male or female, you're all one in Christ Jesus. Then the multitude kept silent, listening to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the who? Gentiles. Gentiles. There's an apostolic example. Paul and Barnabas in chapters 13 and 14 went and made Gentile converts throughout a big portion of Asia Minor, and he said, we converted them to Jesus Christ. They were Gentiles when we baptized them. They're Gentiles after we baptized them. And God worked miracles and signs to approve of what we were doing. And God never said anything wrong, was wrong with that. And so there's an apostolically approved example. And then in verse 13, after they had become silent, James, the Lord's brother, says, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And notice he didn't say Simon showed us how God turned Gentiles into proselytes. They did that in the old law. And he said, and with this, the words of the prophet agree. Just as it is written, let's read this. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David. Do you know what the tabernacle of David was? That was the kingly lineage that had been destroyed for the last 400 years. There hadn't been a king on the throne since the Babylonians came in and destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. And so here the tabernacle or the household of David had been lying dormant for 400 years. And now Jesus Christ, the son of David, comes and he becomes king of kings and lord of lords. The only problem is his throne's not in Jerusalem, it's in heaven. That's what he's prophesying about. So when God returned and rebuilt the tabernacle of David, which had fallen down, he said, I will rebuild up its ruins and I will set it up. Why? So that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name. I wonder what name that might be. They were called Christians first hand. You know, I don't know why anybody ever thought the name Christian was the name of derision because it's an honor to wear the name that embeds the name Christ in it, don't you think? There's no question about who I am. And in our religiously divided world, sometimes people want to call us Church of Christers. Well, I'm not a Church of Christ, I never had even met one. I don't know what that is. What are you people? We're Christians. Oh, well, we're all Christians. No, you're something else. You wear a different name. The Baptists wear a name that honors the act of baptism. Baptism is important, but we don't wear that name. Methodist, the name Method is embedded in that title, and that emphasizes the fact that uh, the forefathers of the Methodist Church believed in going to college campuses, that they needed a method by which they could teach college people how to be righteous and godly while they're away from home. And it's a great motivation, but you don't become a Methodist because of that. 
Presbyterians emphasize the fact that their leaders are presbyters or elders or bishops. And that's a biblical term, but you don't honor that name. So we call ourselves Christians, and this body is the church of Christ, because we honor the one we follow. Anyway, the rest of mankind, even the Gentiles are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Now this James, the Lord's brother, saying, the Old Testament prophesied of what you have seen with your own eyes. And so by direct command, apostolic example, and by the implication of necessary inference, he's quoting a prophecy and making the application, the inference to Gentiles as Gentiles becoming Christians. And so he said, known to God from eternity are all of his works. God knew he was going to do this long before Abraham was ever born, long before the Jew ever set foot on the earth, long before there was all these cultural differences. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted to idols, by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. So what he's saying in essence is we want Gentiles to remain as they are. They're saved by the blood of Christ, not by the law of Moses. But at the same time, we want them not to be offensive to our Jewish brethren or to God. And so this is how you establish the truth of them and now. Today we don't have apostles, we have the New Testament, which is the word of the apostles. And so the inspired conclusion they came to, and they sent this letter out, based upon those three ways of establishing authority was, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. You see that? They didn't do any voting, did they? No. You had an apostle stand up and say, well, God directed me to save the household of Cornelius. You had another apostle, Paul, stand up and say, God worked miracles to confirm that what we were doing was approved. You had James, the Lord's own brother, stand up and say, the Old Testament showed this was going to happen a long time ago. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. You know why it seemed good to them? Because they could figure out what the law meant. To lay no greater burden upon you than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you'll do well, farewell. You know what's missing? No circumcision for salvation. This didn't stop the conflict, but it solved the problem in Antioch. Because it says in verse 31 through 33, when they took that letter up to Antioch and read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. You Gentiles are okay. Don't worry about these troublemakers who came up from Judea. They were wrong about it. You're right in the sight of God. Wouldn't that make you feel good? Judas and Silas themselves being prophets, by the way, Judas and Silas came up with Barnabas and Saul to just confirm that what had happened in Jerusalem was exactly right and true. So they, being prophets, also exhorted and strengthened the brethren in many words, and after they had stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. There's the melding together of various backgrounds, and yet it was a difficult thing to do. So what do we learn about the church in Antioch? It's a wonderful congregation. No wonder they were called Christians first there. But notice what we've learned about them tonight. May we as a congregation of God's people strive to be what they were, biblically sound. By direct command, apostolically approved example, necessary inference, just like they did in the beginning as we do today. Benevolent. We're willing and have in the past helped the brethren and churches in their dire need. We'll be glad to do that again when necessary. Evangelistic. We need to be more evangelistically minded. We do support other preachers in other places, but we as individual Christians need to be more interested in the local churches in our area that we can help and encourage. And united in one. That's not easy to do because when you're dealing with the way you grew up, or the way you learned a certain thing, and you learn something different from somebody else, and you hear things differently than others do. It takes a period of time and a lot of patience and long suffering with one another so that we can all understand each other and get along together. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, Paul explained that when he said this. 
He says, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak what? Same. The same thing. That there be no divisions among you. And that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and same judgment. Again, how do you do that? By forgetting all of your differences with people and focusing on the one thing that makes us all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. We're all saved the same way. We all remain saved the same way. Jesus Christ is all of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ is all of our older brother. Jesus Christ is all of our high priest. And because of that oneness we have in Christ, we are one with one another. And so we need to always emphasize that and keep that in mind. And let us be unique before God because a congregation as loving as the one in Antioch is the kind of congregation we want to be today. 2,000 years separate us, but everything they were, we can be if we're not already. And so let's think about what the church in Antioch was and study and meditate upon that and strive to be that kind of person and that kind of congregation ourselves. I appreciate you listening. If you'd like to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's nothing keeping you from it. Jesus said, go preach the gospel to all nations. No matter what color their skin is, what their nationality may be, what their language may be, what their cultural backgrounds may be, you can all forget all of those things to become one in Christ Jesus by faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. As you rise to walk in newness of life, you can become part of the great family of God in Christ Jesus. Isn't that a comfort? It is to me. If you'd like to obey the gospel and join that family, we invite you to come while we stand in the same.